So the, the final speaker this morning is Louise Britton, uh, also a researcher from Ireland. Um, so, no further ado, I'll just pass on oh. to you. Oh, right. Okay, so good morning everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss our work on the long-term experimental infection of cattle with paratuberculosis. So I'm a part of the ICON-MAP study that stands for Improved Control of MAP, and it's a large, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary study funded by the Irish Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. It consists of three main work packages. The first is looking into evaluating and validating current diagnostic methodologies. The third is looking into on-farm control strategies and cost-benefit analyses. And the second, of which I'm a part, is researching prognostic biomarker discovery and validation. And of course, central to that is the creation of an experimentally infected herd of cattle and the collection of samples of known MAP status. So why do we need new diagnostic or prognostic biomarkers? And to understand that, you really need to understand a bit more about the pathogenesis of the infection. And again, other speakers have touched on this this morning as well. So in brief, cattle are infected as calves, primarily by the fecal oral route, but also through milk and perhaps in utero as well. Initially after infection, the host is going to mount a cell-mediated immune response against infection, dominated by high levels of interferon gamma. And this cytokine will act to contain and control the infection. During this time, the animal won't be showing clinical signs, but may be shedding low amounts transiently through the feces and represent a transmission risk to the rest of the herd. Subsequently then, a few years down the line, a small number of animals will go on to mount a humoral immune response against infection, characterized by rising antibody titers. These animals will start to lose control of the infection and descend into clinical signs and be shedding an awful lot more through the feces. It's not that clear cut, but it illustrates it, I suppose. So Marcel talked in detail about PCR-based techniques and, and Aideen touched on the culture and the ELISAs as well. So fecal culture and antibody ELISAs, very commonly used, anti-mortem tests. Culture being the gold standard, it's going to detect viable MAP organisms, very specific, nearly 100%, excluding passive pass-through from a heavily contaminated environment. However, in some subclinically infected animals that won't be shedding very much, the sensitivity can be as low as 23 to 29%. That's going to rise to about 70 to 74% in animals that are losing control of the infection, but you'll still miss a number of animals, and it will take months. Antibody ELISAs, there's several on the market. Broadly, their performance is similar. Again, fairly specific, but may be confounded by the TB test, the intradermal TB test, and also perhaps by environmental mycobacteria. But it's their sensitivity that really is the problem. So for infectious animals, the sensitivity of the serum ELISA is put between 21 and 91%, and for the milk ELISA is between 24 and 61%. So there is room for improvement there. So our experimental infection then began back in 2013 when two suitable autumn calving herds were located to source male Holstein Frisian calves. Now both of these herds, they did have a low level of seropositivity, but they had never had a culture positive and they'd never had a clinical case of Yone's disease. Moreover, the farmers, they were very willing to work with us and give us all the information we required and also to take advice from us on things like colostrum management, which was really very helpful. Um, however, before we took these animals, we did conduct a number of pre-movement tests. So from the dams, we took fecal samples for MAP culture, obviously, and for salmonella culture, for biosecurity reasons. From the calves, we took serum samples in the first week of life for zinc sulfide turbidity testing. They were all BVD negative, and they were all clinically well prior to transportation. So the calves then, they were randomized based on source and age, either to the challenged group or to the control group, and they were collected at around about 14 days of age. They were housed initially in small stable groups of three to five animals and mixed slowly then after weaning. They would have received colostrum from their own dam and then they would have been put onto a good quality milk replacer and we weaned them between 10 to 14 weeks of age. Special animals then require special management protocols and it was important to us to obtain a deviation from the intradermal TB test um, because again, it can affect the Yone's diagnostics and we achieved that because we do test them very regularly using the interferon gamma assay, using both PPDA and B. And these animals are quarantined, they're not moved except to slaughter and then they receive a full PM examination. In the event of illness then, what therapeutics we could use? Well, there's very little um, information about this in the literature, but as a general rule, for example, we wanted to steer away from antibiotics with um, anti-mycobacterial action and some other compounds. 
um, none of which would really be used commonly anyway in cattle practice. Vaccinations, they're vaccinated against a range of clostridial organisms, IBR and also BVD, which perhaps isn't so strange when you realize that they are housed in a research facility, and from time to time in the past there would have been PI animals passing through. Now the biosecurity around our animals is very strong, but it was just an extra control measure. Also, because it's a three-year study, it's long-term and they're housed for the duration of that, uh, the health of their feet was quite important to us. So all animals would have access to a solid floored, straw bedded area. Um, we put rubber mats down on the slats to cushion their walking surface and we foot bathe them regularly using copper sulfate and visually inspect them. So the animals then were challenged as soon as the numbers became available to us. They would have been between four to six weeks of age at this point. In total, to begin with, there were 35 animals in the challenged group and 20 in the control group. The strain we used was CIT-003. This was from a clinical um, case in Munster, and it was given to us by Jim O'Mahony, Cork Institute of Technology. And the challenged animals received 3.8 by 10 to the 9 colony forming units on two consecutive days, whereas the controls received a placebo, which was growth medium. So these then are the first set of results. These are the results of the bovigam interferon gamma assay over the course of the challenge study. So you're looking at PPDA in red and PPDJ in green. And you can see really that the two PPDs are mirroring each other, as you would expect. In the first year, there is a difference between the two groups, which wanes in the second year and has become slightly more variable then in, in the last two testing intervals, which might indicate that some of the animals are progressing. Fecal samples have been cultured at very regular intervals using the Versatrek Paragem system. Uh, however, to date, they've all been negative. It's, it's worth noting that the positive controls have always been positive. Also, uh, tissue samples collected at the month 12 and 24 culling intervals, that would be ileum and lymph nodes, have been negative. These are the results then of the IDEX serum identification and verification ELISA, and you can see that we have had seropositive results, mostly in the challenged group and mostly from the second year onwards. However, there have been two individual control animals that have also tested seropositive. So these are the results then in more detail. So the challenged animals are there at the top, and you can see that there is a small number that um, do tend to be consecutively seropositive, or at least have multiple seropositive results behind them. Um, these animals have all been culture negative and none of them have been post-mortemed yet. Uh, the control animals then, the first one, 2170, was post-mortem two months after that seropositive result with no other indications of Yone's disease. And the animal 2454 then down at the bottom is still in the herd, um, status unknown. Culling intervals then, so at the end of the first and the second year post-challenge, we culled 13 animals. That would be eight challenged and five control animals each time. Prior to euthanasia, all animals received a clinical examination and they were all healthy. Uh, we also took bloods for hematology and biochemistry and they were unremarkable. Uh, this is just our animals there back in March, I think, and you can see that really they're looking very well. Um, to date, we really haven't had any problems with them. So post-mortem results then from the first year, well, there was minimal gross or histopathological differences between the two groups of animals. In the second year, however, there was gross pathology. So you can see this one challenged animal here, which has this really marked thickening and corrugation of the ileum relative to the control animal beside it. There was also another challenged animal that had more um, subtle thickening. And six of the eight challenged animals that would have been post-mortemed at this time point had enlarged ileocecal lymph nodes. However, this did not translate to a typical granulomatous type response upon histopathological analysis of ileum and ileal lymph node samples. However, the two animals with the ileal lesions did have a more severe lymphoplasmocytic infiltration of the lamina propria. And one of them had a very small clump of acid fast bacilli in one of the very many ZN stain sections that were examined. So in future, while well, we're going to continue doing conventional tests by which I mean culture, ELISA, and interferon gamma, this study comes to an end in August, so we have 28 animals left, 19 challenged and 9 control animals, and it would, um, August represents the month 33 post-challenge intervals. So it's quite a long study. However, the main point of this work uh, was to create a biobank of samples for prognostic biomarker analysis, and um, for example, Ronan Shoftesy is somewhere in this uh, very large room, and he's done some microRNA profiling of the early blood samples, and he's a poster downstairs if you're interested in looking at that later. So acknowledgements to my supervisors, Brian, Steve, Nola, Jim, and Joe, and also to the staff on the farm who take such good care of these animals on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's the end.
Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them. So thank you very much, Louise. Are there any questions? Can I, sorry, jumping ahead a little bit, but you, you referred a couple of times to the, the purpose is to create the biobank. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the overarching function of this biobank? So it's just to collect samples of known MAP status. So we would be collecting fecal samples at very regular intervals, also blood samples, serum samples, and um, also tissue samples from the culling time points that we can go back to and look, look over. But, and are these, these samples that are going to be from unusually young animals for this disease. Is that going to be? Yeah, the thing about experimental infections is that they're, they're quite expensive um, to conduct, so a lot of them would tend to be quite a bit shorter. This would be one of the longer ones, so these samples are quite valuable in, in that regard. Okay. Are there any further questions? If not, then I would just like to thank Louise thank and also much. thank all the other speakers for their presentations. It was an excellent array of of uh, work on paratuberculosis. There's more to come, but thank everyone again. <laughs>